So hi everyone, I am Kay Farlow and I'm so excited that you've invited me to present to you all today. I'm an occupational therapist discipline and I am currently serving as the CDC's Act Early Ambassador for the state of Massachusetts. I've been in this position since February of 2019 and my job is really to educate everyone on the importance of developmental monitoring using the Learn the Signs Act Early program. I am also working in Head Start this calendar school year, um, two days a week on a grant. And so I am just, I've fallen in love with Head Start and I really appreciate what you all are doing in that setting. So today's objectives is hopefully you'll be able to learn how to support families and um, work with the Learn the Signs Act early for parent engagement using the free developmental monitoring tools. And hopefully after today, you'll also understand the difference between developmental monitoring and screening and the importance of both. So the Learn the Signs Act early, it really improves early identification of children with delays. And it's about promoting parent engaged developmental monitoring. So why is this so important? Well, over the past 10 years has really been a huge push for pediatricians to increase the amount of screening that's being done. And even though there really has been this huge increase, the CDC is estimating that still more than half of the children that need services before age three are not receiving them. And so there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And so hopefully if we can start having everyone in the community do developmental monitoring, we will catch all of those children who are currently not receiving services. For children with autism spectrum disorder, parents are noting concerns around 18 months, yet these children are still not receiving a diagnosis until around age four. And one in four children ages birth to five are at a moderate or high risk for a developmental delay. So my job as the ambassador is to try to get everyone on the same page and using the same language. So I work with parents, you all work with parents, I'm working with phys um, physicians, clinicians like myself, OTPTs, SLPs, everyone in the EEC space, um, and, and just trying to really promote developmental monitoring to try to get these children identified as quickly as possible. I uh, just like to say working in Head Start, you are all so awesome. Um, I feel as though um, working in Head Start, you may all, not always get a thank you. And I just wanna say thank you because as you know, poverty and disability create enormous stress on families, which really negatively impacts child development. And your work with these families really does make a difference. So pediatricians do what we call surveillance, and there are six steps to surveillance. And the first step is to review checklists. And this developmental monitoring that we're talking about is part of this surveillance that pediatricians do. So pediatricians, when you bring your child to the doctor, they do ongoing surveillance. Well, they'll review a checklist. They'll look at your developmental history. They may ask concerns. They may obsess the child's strengths and risks, observe the child a little bit, document, and then hopefully share the results with EEC providers, WIC, et cetera. So developmental screening is what um, you all are doing in Head Start, right? So developmental screening is a formal process. It's done by physicians, clinicians, and teachers with specialized training. And we do it when we do a screening, we're using a validated screening tool unlike developmental monitoring. Developmental monitoring can be done by everyone in the community, parents, EEC teachers, uh, YMCA teachers, librarians, everybody. And it's really an ongoing process that begins at birth. And so the Learn the Science Act Early program is an example of a tool to complete developmental monitoring. So the research has shown if we combine developmental monitoring with screening, that's really how we can catch the most amount of children with delays. So sometimes I hear people use these terms interchangeably and they are not. When we do developmental monitoring, we're actually trying to increase the amount of screening that is being done. So one does not replace the other. We're really hoping that if we can increase the amount of developmental monitoring that's being done, we will then in turn increase the amount of developmental screening that's being done. 
So just to give you sort of a quick snapshot of maybe some of the differences for those of you that do screening um, between monitoring and screening, here's a few different skills. So for example, um, when we're talking about a child sitting without support, we would expect that skill around six months because around 50% of the children can do this at six months. And so using the screening tool, the SWIC, the Survey of Wellbeing of Young Children, this is where you would look for that. Unlike developmental monitoring, you would see on the nine month checklist and it would say, if your child is not sitting without support at nine months, please go see the doctor, right? And so same with being two objects together, around 50% of the children can do this at six months. That's what we would see on the checklist for screening. But for developmental monitoring, we wouldn't see this until a nine month checklist. And it would be, if your child isn't able to bang two objects together, then please go see the doctor. So the American Academy of Pediatrics has a recommended child while visit schedule, and this is the well visit schedule. So parents are asked to take their kids to the doctor at one month, two months, four months, six months, et cetera. Out of all of these visits, the child is only being screened those four times that you see highlighted. So this is what the concern is. So the pediatricians have really bumped up the amount of screening that's being done, but they're still only being screened these four times unless parents bring up concerns. So that's really what this conversation is about, is we're hoping that all of you in Head Start can start doing developmental monitoring with the family so that when they go to the doctors for these child well visits, they can bring these checklists to really start that conversation with the doctor. So here's, um, we're just gonna talk about the difference between monitoring, screening, and evaluation really quickly. So monitoring is something that everyone in the community can do, right? So if we look at the skills that we're looking for, for six to eight months for developmental monitoring, we might look for rolls from tummy to back, um, reaches a, and grab a toy what they want, Whereas screening, again, is a snapshot with a validated tool. And when we're monitoring, if we have a concern, then we're going to screen, right? We're asking for someone to screen that child as a result of a concern on a developmental monitoring checklist. When the child is screened, if we have a concern, we are then going to ask for the child to be evaluated. So I just want to show that you know, on the SWIC here for six to eight months, you will see there's one, two, three, four, five, six items that you would be looking at for milestones. But then when you do a comprehensive evaluation, this is the Peabody Developmental Motor Skills test that I often use in occupational therapy. You can see that all of these skills are being asked to be looked at for six months. And then these are the skills also for seven and eight months. So when we are referring a child for a screen, it doesn't mean that they're gonna be um, receiving services. When we refer for an evaluation, they're gonna have a very large comprehensive evaluation, which will determine whether or not that child needs services. So I never want anyone to worry about referring a child because no child ever is ever gonna get services who doesn't qualify or doesn't need them. So never worry about referring someone. When in doubt, just send them to get it checked out, right? When in doubt, check it out. I also just want to make a note here about culture. So sometimes parents will say, or teachers will say, well, I think they're not using a spoon because it's cultural. Or, you know, the child isn't dressing themselves because it's cultural. And that absolutely could be the case. However, I always recommend that everyone still refer because you're not re you're not saying that there's a problem. You're just saying, let's look into it. Because the reason why the child isn't using a spoon or dressing themselves could very well be cultural, but it also could be that the parents are doing it for them because they're having um, a lot of trouble. So although it could be cultural, when you do a comprehensive evaluation on that skill, the clinician is going to be able to determine whether it's cultural or whether there's an underlying motor problem. So we always, when in doubt, um, always refer. And even if you think it might be cultural for the reason why that child has that deficit, still always refer because a comprehensive evaluation is going to be able to tease that out.
Okay, so the Learn the Science Act early program is it consists of a lot of free materials. So this Watch Me Here program um, is an online free continuing education program. It consists of four modules. It takes about 45 minutes to an hour to complete. And when you complete it, you can get a certificate of completion. And this is, can be done in English or Spanish. It is my goal that every Head Start employee will have completed this um, continuing ed as part of their onboarding training so that when you get hired you know you have to do these certain trainings when you first get hired and i'm hoping that the watch me will then be part of that onboarding training there are also growth charts there's a free digital toolkit there's the free app there's posters there's the checklist there's lots of tips there's books the books are wonderful um, and we're just going to talk about a couple of those programs how, um, materials. Well, their CDC um, has updated the developmental checklist, and there's been some concern about that. So I'm just going to talk about that for a few minutes. So the developmental monitoring checklists were updated in order to really increase clarity, to reduce the wait and see approach that they were seeing, and also to try to increase the amount of referrals. The new um, checklist also now follows the American Academy of Pediatrics recommended well child visits by adding the 15 and 30 month checklist. The new checklists um, are reduced in the amount of milestones from 22 to 13. And the big difference is that there's no more two columns. So on the old checklist, there was a column on the left that had all of the looking for milestones around the 50th percentile. And on the right, there were sort of these red flag milestones in the purple box that said, if your child isn't able to do this, go see the doctor. Well, on the new checklist, they're all red flag milestones. So if a child isn't able to meet one of these milestones, you would then refer for a screening. Of the milestones on the old checklist, about 40% were replaced, and there are 65 new milestones. All the milestones selected for the checklist were supported by evidence and expert agreement, and the milestones that were removed had little or no normative data when, um, when the milestone should be achieved by 75% of the children. So in the OT and PT community, a lot of therapists were upset that crawling was removed. Um, but if you look at the Zubler article, which is the research article to support these updates, the link is in the resources. It is an open access article. So you can um, all review the article if you'd like to see any particular milestone. There's evidence for every milestone that was kept. And there's a reason why every milestone was removed, it was removed. So so crawling was removed because of the literature reviewed, there was little or no normative data available to include it on the checklist. All right, so here on this slide, you have the old checklist on the left and the new checklist on the right. And so on the checklist on the left, you can see that it has this column here. These were the looking for um, milestones that were all around the 50th percentile. And in the purple box, you had, if your child isn't doing this, please see the doctor. And all of these milestones here in this purple box were between the 75th percentile or more, sometimes 90, sometimes more, right? So we were referring around the 75th percentile on the old ones. And now on the new checklist, we're still referring at that 75th percentile or more. So on the new checklist, if a child isn't meeting one of these milestones, you would refer them to the doctor. What I really like also about these checklists, especially in the Head Start setting, is it really, it, every checklist has a star if the child is due for a screening. So if you are, say, in the infant toddler room and you have a nine month old, you're going to see, oh, there's a star. That means that the child is due for a screening. So I know in one of the classrooms that I work at, you know, that this one particular child that I talked to the teacher about, he passed the screening, even though he had very little expressive language, he did so well in growth motor on the ESI that he passed the screen and the teacher's like there's really not a lot I can do because he passed the screen and the parents don't have any concerns yet she still has concerns so these checklists would be a great tool to sort of bring up this conversation with the pediatrician so think of these checklists as a huge communication tool so there's these open-ended questions on the checklist as well as on the app where you could type in your concerns or write in your concerns you know um, there's a lot of times there's feeding concerns with younger children and that's not necessarily 
one of the items, but you could write that in, right? So it, it's a way to have a conversation with the parents and then they can take that, or if it's on their phone on the app, they take it to the pediatrician. And it's a way to really start that conversation about what's going on with the child. So here's a couple examples of things that changed. So on the old checklist, if we're looking at rolling as an example, it was on the four month checklist for looking for a milestone around the 50th percentile. And it was also on the six month checklist in that purple box. So if your child wasn't rolling at six months, please go talk to the doctor. Well, now rolling is just on the six month checklist. So if your child isn't rolling at six months, please refer to the doctor. So we're still referring at the same age at that 75th percentile. Another example is sitting without support. So on the old checklist, we were the, the verbiage was begins to sit without support. On the six-month checklist, we were looking for that. And then on the nine-month checklist, it was in both columns. It was the looking for sits without support on the nine-month. And then in that purple box, um, we were referring if the child doesn't sit with help. Well, now it's just on the nine-month checklist, sits without support. So if your child isn't doing that, you're going to refer to the doctor. So um, on my social media, there was, you know, the, the CDC transferred the milestones to an older age. This isn't true. The milestones did not change. We're not changing anything with screening tools. N none of the milestones have changed. It's just the way we're using the tool has changed. So we were referring at 75% before, and now we're still referring at 75. It's just, you know, before sitting was on the six month, but we weren't referring. And now it's just on the nine months. So hopefully that'll clear up some concerns. Um, here's a couple examples of ways that things have changed as well. So um, on the old checklist, transfer an object was on the looking for six month. And it was in the purple box as a flag if you couldn't transfer it at nine months, and now it's just on nine months. So again, um, you know, this conversation that people were having that they really transferred to an older age, they didn't. Like the milestones have not changed. Some of the other comments that I got was that due to COVID, the CDC pushed back when children are expected to do things. No, that's not true at all. In fact, the update started in 2019 before COVID. These updates are actually to try to get more children referred. So before, when we had that 50% column, it was very confusing. And parent, even my students, because I teach my students, they'd be like, well, Dr. B, if the child doesn't have any on the, you know, they're missing a few on the 50th percentile, it's fine. And I'd be like, yeah, you know, so it was very confusing. Well, now it's much clearer, I think, that if a child is missing one of them, you will refer. So here are some milestones that change from the 50th percentile to the 75th percentile. And I think this is where people are getting confused. So let's take a look. So patty cake was on the old checklist for looking for at the 50th percentile. And now it's on the new checklist um, at the 12th month, but now it's the 75th. So this is actually good. So before we were just looking for it at 12 months, but now if the child doesn't have it, now we're referring at 12 months. So this is actually an improvement, right? So the updated research has shown that actually we want to refer if they don't have this at this point. So another one would be says mama and data before we were looking for it at 12 months saying on the old checklist, it was on the 50th percentile, but now with the reviewing all the evidence, we're saying, no, this is really the 75th percentile. And if the child's not doing this at 12 months, we want to refer them. So this is actually an improvement. There's also some milestones that went much earlier, which is great, right? So bang things to two things together. I'm an OT, so right, this is very important for me. Um, bang things, two things together. It was a look for milestone at 12 months and it wasn't listed as a flag. Well, now it's on the nine month checklist as a flag, right? So this is great. So now if the child's not banging two things together at nine months, we're gonna flag. So these are a lot of improvements. Um, there was also a lot of confusion about pointing on the old checklist. Pointing is a huge communication skill, but as you can see here, it was on a lot of the checklists, where now it's only on four of the checklists, so hopefully it will really reduce some of that confusion. There are 65 new milestones, um, so, you know, jumps off ground with two feet is one of them, which is great, and again, the new ones were really added because they had good supporting evidence. So the team that got together in 2019 to do the revisions was an interprofessional 
group of experts, right? These are some really impressive people that got together um, to do the revisions. And I will say that one of the physicians is also dual trained as a speech and language pathologist. There has been um, a little bit of an uproar in the OT and PT community that an OT and a PT was not asked to be part of the revisions, but the CDC has taken that feedback very well. And I think it'll even include um, the OTs and PTs if they were to do a revision the next time around. Um, just as a sort of reminder about these checklists, these surveillance tools, they're not screeners, they're not pre-screeners, they're not therapeutic guidelines, right? So um, my boss, we were just in San Antonio for this AOTA conference, and she heard an another director say, well, the therapists don't even know if they're supposed to teach crawling now because it's what now it's not a milestone anymore. And I was like, oh my goodness, no, like no, right? So no, like crawling of course is still a very important milestone and therapists are not changing what we're doing. We're not going to not look for crawling. Um, we are not changing what we're doing. This is not a screening tool, right? This is not a therapeutic guideline. And these tools are not validated. This is a public health communication tool. So really think about that in, in the way you look at this. These are public health communication tools to help families start a conversation with their pediatrician, right? Help um, you all in EEC, help Head Start teachers have that conversation with parents. Sometimes, you know, if, especially if it's a new family, if you don't feel like you have that rapport or the migrant program in Mason Square, um, one of the teachers was telling me how all of the families, most of the families are from Guatemala and they don't have that sort of same education about milestones. And so it's sort of this, um, if, it, if, if it's a new family, it's a little bit awkward. So you can use these tools to blame everything on the CDC because the CDC carries a lot of weight, right? Um, I'm not saying that you need to go see the CDC see the doctor, the CDC is saying you need to go see the doctor, right? So you can, if you don't feel like you have that rapport with the family yet, you can just blame it on the CDC. You know, oh, well here it says if the child isn't doing this, I'm not seeing this in the classroom. Are you seeing this in home? Oh, not yet. Well, listen, why don't you try to see that in the next couple of weeks? I know you're going in for that. You're due for a screening tool. You're due for a screening with the pediatrician. Take this with you and talk to the doctor about this, because this is what I'm seeing in the classroom. And this is what the CDC is saying. Right. So really put take it off you so you can keep that rapport and put it on the CDC. Um, when the pediatricians do surveillance, it's so much more than the checklist, right? It's really about looking at the child, talking with the parents, finding out what's going on. So think of these developmental monitoring tools as communication tools, not as therapeutic tools, okay? Not screeners. All right, so back to this American Academy of Pediatric Well Visit schedule. The developmental monitoring checklist match the schedule exactly. So if we think about the toddler rooms where you may get a child at 2.9 and, you know, they're not going to be screened again by the doctor and then they're going to go off to school and you have concerns, right? So this would be a great way to try to get that child screened, especially if they pass the screen in your classroom. So if you know you have concerns, but for some reason they pass the screen, you have them in your classroom, what, you know, even if they pass the screen, let's say they passed a screen at 2.9, if they, if they fall in the 26th percentile, they pass. But as we know, as children get older, if there's even a little bit of a delay, the delay gets wider, right? The gap between typical and delay gets wider and wider as kids get older. So if the kid passes the screen at 2.9, but you're like, oh my goodness, there's just something not right. You can try to get that child screened again through the pediatrician by filling out these forms because there's a three year, a four year, a five year, right? Um, and so you can bring up these concerns to the pediatrician because unless the parent brings up concern, the child is not going to receive another screen after two and a half. And we know that as children age, that gap between typical and delay gets wider. So maybe they didn't qualify at two and a half, but they definitely would at four and a half. So let's get the ball rolling, right? So again, when in doubt, just check it out. Nobody's ever getting services that doesn't need them. 
Okay, so the Milestone Moments booklets, um, they're super cute and I like them. I, I work PRN in an early intervention and I always carry them with me because it has all of the checklists right there handy um, from two months to five years of age. It's also a nice tool to have in your classroom. They come in English and Spanish and, you know, they... They have nice tips and activities that um, you can talk about with the parents. It's a nice parent engagement piece. One thing I really like about these new booklets is the screening log in the back. So um, working in the Springfield area, I have a lot of families with unstable housing. And so if you know the family's leaving or you think they're gonna move in with grandma or et cetera, this is really nice because they can keep this with them. So they were screened, here were the results, take this with you so that you're not, because you might not be able to follow them. So this is a great new addition. Um, if you are not familiar with the screening passport, um, I, by the way, I emailed these slides to Vanessa, so she has all of these, so she can give them to you. Um, but this is the screening passport that I used to use for my families with unstable housing before they included it in the new milestone booklet. So just another resource for you. All right, so the milestone checklist, this is what they look like, and you can print them out online. Um, they are also now available in English on the Mass Act Early website, which we're really excited about. And you can also print them out. So at all of the Massachusetts WIC centers, they've been printed out and they use them laminated and they go over the checklist. So if you are in, say, a classroom where you only have kids that are two, three, and four, oh, and five, um, you can just laminate those and then you have them and you only need four. So um, it can be user-friendly in that way. Um, one of the things that um, the new milestones, it's really nice, is that when you're talking with a child, uh, with a parent, and, and the parent says, I'm not sure, um, and this language is very clear on the app, when you're completing it, you know, does your child do this? If the parent is not sure, then you want to say, and the language is right on the paperwork for you, okay, well, watch that milestone over the next week or two, and then if your child's not doing it, then we're going to refer, right? So they're giving the parent two weeks to be sure or not sure, and then we're going to refer. Again, we're really just trying to reduce that wait and see approach. So all of the milestones, just to summarize here, that are on the new checklist are between the 75th to 90th percentile or more, which means if the child is not reaching one of these milestones, it's really late and it definitely deserves a conversation, okay? All right, so be confident in the Learn the Signs Act early. You are not going to um, refer children unnecessarily or unnecessarily bring up concerns because if, if they're missing a milestone, it's, a, it's, it's late. <laughs> all right, so here are some of the books. They all come into English and Spanish. Um, the B Baby's Busy Day is a board book about one-year-olds. Um, I love Where is Bear. Um, it's a, the two-year-old book, and Amazing Me is the three-year-old book. And again, these all come in English and Spanish. All of you can go on to the CDC website and order your own materials, and it can be shipped to your house individually. The thing is, is that the warehouse, it's very flexible, right? Like sometimes they have all, all the materials in and sometimes they don't have any of the materials in. Sometimes they only have all the Spanish materials in. So it's not something that you can depend on, right? And each person only gets a limited quantity. So, oh, I really want to get every child in my classroom, you know, one of those board books. Well, each person can only get five, I think. So it's not something that you can sort of plan on having, but please, anytime you want, you can go onto this website and you can order materials. And I hope that you all did get some materials. I did send a box um, to Vanessa. So, and you can always email me. I have a limited supply, but if I have some, I will, I'll drop them off. So it's sort of just like whatever I have, I give away until I don't have any more. And then I, I try to get materials myself. This is the Watch Me program that I was talking about for the continuing ed, and it's really made for like um, center-based childcare or Head Start programs, preschool playground, preschool classrooms, and it's really well done. Um, the Milestone Tracker app, it's free, it's available in English and Spanish, and this is everyone's favorite. Um, we're going to, at the end of today, we're going to practice using the app. So if you haven't already downloaded it, please go ahead and do that so you'll be ready to go. 
these are a pictures of the posters that you can get. Um, there's um, growth charts, which are really nice. If any of you are in charge of the website, um, this is an example of a button here at the bottom. This is a new term for me. And so instead of having the link, you can have a cute button. So if they click on the button, it'll bring you to the CDC webpage. Um, there's lots of tip sheets on there. So the CDC website's pretty big, the Learn the Signs Act early. So you kind of have to fool around with it a little bit to find what you're looking for. But these tip sheets are really nice. Um, you could, you know, print out the checklist, the developmental monitoring checklist, and one of these how to talk to the doctor and give them both to the parents if you know um, that they're going. And think about the parents that English is their second language. I know I get nervous when I go to the doctors and I'll like, you know, oh, I want to ask the doctor this, this, and this, and then I get there. And why do I, I get nervous and somehow I forget what I'm supposed to say. Like, can you imagine if English was my second language, how much even harder that would be? Um, so I just think if we can help parents as much as possible advocate for their children, it, it's really helpful. There's also all these tip sheets for WIC programs, for, like I said, EEC, for home visitors, and there's a whole separate section for Head Start. If you Google Learn the Signs Act Early, this is sort of the screen that you're gonna see here at the top. And if you scroll down, you can see this ECE tab here, and then you would click on that and then it will bring you right to the Head Start. All right, so nobody wants any extra work, right? Especially in this COVID time period. So one of the other ambassadors, um, Stephen, he's amazing. He did this. I did not, I cannot take any credit for this, um, but he works in Head Start as well. And he was saying how all of these materials fit right into the Head Start standards. So we're not really asking you to do anything new, but you can use these free materials to um, meet the standards that you already have. So again, you'll have a copy of this, but um, all of the books can help with your education standard. Um, the app and the um, checklist can help with your disability standard, growth chart for the health standard, um, again, the tracker app milestone moments booklets um, for the family services. These are great family engagement tools. I know some of the ambassadors will um, have one of the parents read the book and then um, they help the children act out the milestones. So how can you um, really support that parent engagement? These books are really great for that. For professional development, you can do um, the Watch Me continuing education program that I mentioned. Um, and again, if you have any questions in the future, just email me and I will absolutely help you. These, um, all of these tools are really designed for in parent engagement, right? And really to help parents advocate for their children and to know when you need to refer. So asking for help. So when a parent has a concern, they should always go to the pediatrician, right? We always want to send them to the pediatrician. But in addition to that, or if we're not getting the response from the pediatrician that we would like, let's say the pediatrician is continuing to give a wait and see approach, um, families can also go directly to family ties, early intervention, and special education. So if you aren't familiar with Family Ties. Family Ties is a parent advocacy group specific to Massachusetts, and they act as the statewide directory for early intervention services in Massachusetts. So again, if you have a family with unstable housing and you know that they're moving, but you have a concern about that child, you can just give them this phone number and be like, look, when you get settled, just call Family Ties and they're going to help you. You know, they'll hook you up with whatever early intervention service your catchment area you're in, or they'll help you if the child's over 2.9, you know, then they'll hook you up. They'll tell you what your local um, elementary school is so you can go down to the elementary school and sign for an evaluation. So Family Ties is just, they will take care of it for you. And they also have a nice, um, it's a huge uh, magazine that they have, um, but they also do things like respite care for families with kids with special needs. They also have a lot of resources as far as like um, parent advocacy groups for children with autism, um, ballet classes for children with Down syndrome, right? So they have like the statewide resources. It's just a really amazing group of people. So if you didn't know about Family Ties, then today was worth your time. 
Okay, so when a family is trying to ask for help, they have choices, right? So they can go to the pediatrician and the pediatrician is maybe gonna refer to the outpatient therapy. They're gonna refer them to early intervention or special education. The family can go right to early intervention, right? Birth to 2.9. They can go right to special education, 2.9 and over, or they can go to family ties and then family ties will then refer them to either early intervention or special education. If you didn't know this, if you're new to Massachusetts, early intervention services are free in Massachusetts. This is not true for all states, but in Massachusetts, all early intervention services are free. So especially working in Head Start, there's always a concern about the family's ability to pay for services um, or transportation, right? So early intervention is free and they will come to the family's house. So don't worry about referring the family um, because early intervention, again, is free in Massachusetts. Another nice thing about early intervention is that the child doesn't have to have a diagnosis. So sometimes families are afraid because of the stigma associated with a child who has a diagnosis. Well, you don't have to have a diagnosis in early intervention. So a child who's just behind and needs to catch up can get services, right? And so this is really nice. So if you think that's the issue with the family, you can say, hey, this is just to catch the kids up so they don't have a diagnosis in the future, right? Because in special education, you do have to have a diagnosis. All right, in early intervention, these are all the services that a child can receive. It's fantastic. How many kids receive EI? Well, in 2019, about 5% of infants under one and about 10% of children under three. So there's a lot of children receiving early intervention in Massachusetts. And about only 40% of children who receive EI will be eligible for special ed. And I bring this to everyone's attention because when I first moved here and to Massachusetts, I was getting really upset, well moved back, I should say. Um, I'm from the North Shore originally. When I moved back in 2015, I was getting really angry. Like, why are all my kids aging out and they're not being eligible for special ed? You know, I have all these kids with trauma and sensory issues and my foster kids and like, they are not being found eligible. And um, this woman from Family Ties was like, Kate, you got to switch your narrative. Like, you're looking at this the wrong way. For, you know, she's like, 40% of kids will be eligible because Massachusetts has such an amazing umbrella to catch everyone in early intervention that that's why only 40% of kids will be eligible. She's like, other states have a really small umbrella for criteria, right? So only very few children are eligible for early intervention. Whereas in Massachusetts, we have this huge umbrella to catch kids. So be thankful that we're in Massachusetts where all of these kids qualify for early intervention, and that's why um, few, only 40% receive special ed. So that was very helpful for me, and I stopped being angry, and I'm like, oh, I'm so glad to be back in Massachusetts, right? Um, but for to qualify for special ed in the school, you need to have a diagnosis. So special ed is free. All services are free. Parents can just go down and sign for it. They can get an evaluation every single year. OK, they just have to sign for it. And so even if they go in and they say they want it, the calendar doesn't start until they physically sign. So that's an important thing that we make sure that we tell parents. All right. So you as the teachers have such a close relationship with these families. It's really great to see they trust you so much. Right. And a lot of times, like you're the expert in their lives. So when they come to you, they're they're really putting their trust and their faith in your opinion of their children. And if you think about it, you're with them so much. And for the working plant parents, you might even be with them more than more than they are. Right. And so what I what I really want to express to you is is how important you are in that in the roles of these children because if the fair if the parents are feeling sort of like giving up or no one's listening to me you helping them like you know your child best you talk to that doctor if the doc if the doctor's not saying what you want let's go right to early intervention call family ties get the number like 
help that family know that they know their child best and you as a teacher can really help them advocate because they trust you like you know they trust you with their baby if they didn't they would not send their kids to school they just wouldn't <laughs> right so they don't have to send their kids to head start so um i just feel like what i've seen um since the end of august is just this amazing trust that these parents have for the head start teachers and kudos to all of you so i just think that your role in helping to support the parents and helping them to advocate keep for their children is really priceless. So um, don't underestimate the power that you have. All right, so um, big takeaway message for me is just when in doubt, check it out. If the family has a concern, even if you don't, fine check it out, right? Just, okay, if you're concerned, then go check it out. Because again, no one's ever going to get services who doesn't qualify. So I just want to mention a couple other um, things that you can refer families to. So um, Massachusetts has a home visiting program, and these are all free and voluntary for families. And all of you in Head Start can refer for these home visiting services. And so um, I have a list of some of the services uh, that you may or may not be familiar with. So there's support and connecting to prenatal care, breastfeeding help. Um, there's a lot of help for positive parenting strategies, um, employment and childcare. Um, there are some, um, uh, for families who have unstable housing. Um, so there's a lot of different services that home visiting provides and you can all refer and it's all free, which I think is important um, with the families that you're working with. <clears throat> Here are some more. So pediatric palliative care work network, hopefully that is not uh, a case for a child in your center, but it may be so, or maybe in the future. So it's just important to know that these programs do exist. Um, the Massachusetts Pregnant and Parenting Teen Initiative. So um, again, just know that these services are out there and they're all free for families. Um, you can also all refer to WIC. Um, if you know that your family is um, receiving SNAP, right, food stamps, the, the new SNAP, then they're all automatically eligible for WIC. <clears throat> so sometimes when I'm in early intervention, I'll be like, oh, have you been using your WIC benefits? And they'll be like, no, I, you know, one lady was like, I don't like the lady at this WIC, you know, she's, this is new lady there, she's mean. I'm like, well, I've never encountered that, but go to a different center then, right? Like, you don't like that center, go to another center. Like, it's free food and milk and all of this, like, why would you not pick? And so she's like, all right, I'll try it out again, right? But we want to tell families, like, make sure you use your WIC benefits before your SNAP benefits, because the WIC benefits don't roll over like the SNAP benefits. And these are eligible for these families, and a lot of them just aren't even using them. So let's remind families um, about WIC. And I've seen the WIC flyers in all the Head Start centers that I've been to, um, so I know you all are promoting it. Um, but maybe sometimes just in that conversation, when, you, when the family does come in for that parent meeting to sort of ask them and, ma and make sure that they're um, using it. I would like to just give a kudos to WIC real quickly and let you know that um, Massachusetts was one of the first states, uh, top four states in the country to start implementing um, the Learn the Signs Act early in their centers. And um, these are the seven sites that did an amazing, right? Because we know kids that are uh, at a nutritional risk as well as poverty are at an increased risk for developmental delay. So look at some of the statistics here. They're really crazy, right? Um, so between August 1st, 2019 and December 31st, 2020, 356 kids were referred for additional screening. 562 kids were referred for early intervention, 74 were referred to family ties, 42 were referred to special education services. And this is just from them starting to do developmental monitoring, right? So this is really impressive and it really does work. Okay, so now it's time to practice the app. So if you can pull out your phone and pull up the app. We are going to enter in a couple kids just so you can see how it works. And if you have questions, you can take yourself off mute and ask me a question. Okay, so once you have the app up, you're, you have to choose English or Spanish, and then you're gonna add a child. So the first child that we're gonna add is his name is going to be Lucas. And then the date of birth is gonna be May 25th, 2001. And I'm doing this at the same time, so I have an idea how long it takes. And was your child premature? We're going to say no. And if you don't know, that's totally fine. Just say no. 
and it's a boy and we're gonna say done. So you can see here, Lucas is 10 months old, but we're gonna be completing the nine month checklist. So the checklists are like ages and stages, right? That you're probably most familiar with um, for that screening tool, where they're two months, four months, six months, nine months, 12 months, 15, 18. So if your child falls in between a checklist, you're gonna to go to the younger checklist. All right, so you're gonna scroll up a little bit and you're it's gonna say milestone checklist, zero out of 13 milestones answered. So it's 147 right now. I want you to check the milestone checklist, click on that box and we're gonna complete it. All right, so start tracking, hit that button at the bottom. Now here's the checklist, 148. Is shy, clinging or fearful around strangers? We're gonna say yes and scroll up shows several facial expressions like happy, sad, angry, and surprised. Yes, scroll up. Looks when you call his name. Yes. Reacts when you leave. Yes. Smiles or a laugh when you play peekaboo. Yes. Next section. Makes different sounds like mama and baba. Yes. Lifts arms to be picked up. Yes. Next section. Looks for objects when dropped out of sight. We'll say yes. Thanks, two things together, yes. Next section. Gets to a sitting position by himself, yes. Move things from one hand to the other, yes. Uses fingers to rake food towards himself, yes. Sits without support, yes. Next section. So here are the open-ended questions that if you are helping a family fill this out on their phone, um, sometimes um, when I'm going into a family's home because I work as a feeding consultant, maybe they're going to the GI and I'm not able to go. So they'll be like, here, they'll like pass me their phone and I'll like type in a note because they always have their phone when they go um, with them. So this is a nice area where you could actually type something in if you wanted them um, to show it to the doctor. So is the child missing any milestones? Scroll up. My baby has lost skills, scroll up. I'm concerned that my baby is not doing something I expected him to do, scroll up. I have concerns about how my baby plays, scroll up. I have concerns about other things my baby does. So for me as a feeding consultant, this is usually my box, right? So I can enter in anything that I may have. So let's say anything in the classroom that you have that you didn't feel like the milestone was covering, Maybe it's toilet training issues, right? Who knows? But whatever the issue is, you could type it right in that spot right there. All right. So then my child summary, you're going to click. And now if you scroll up, that summary can be emailed. You see, there's an email summary, show doctor. So you could have it emailed to the parents. You could have it emailed to the doctor, right? So, um, and if you're worried about the HIPAA, right? So it has the child's date of birth on there. I never enter a child's last name. And if a family was concerned, I can always, you know, if it's April 6th, I can make it April 5th. I can just change it by a day if there's ever concerns about that. All right, so it's 1.50. So it took us, you know, three minutes, less than three minutes to complete the checklist, right? So it's an easy, quick tool and it provides a lot of information. Um, if you also have, I got this question once before, if you have a family and they're unsure of their legal status in the country, I've been asked, well, where does this information go? It, it doesn't go anywhere. Like it's not um, uploaded to some CDC or ICE site, right? Like it, that's not what happens. Um, when I used to have my students go into the WIC centers, I would have them type it in and then delete it right off the iPad and they would see the information deleted. So if you have a classroom iPad or the family doesn't have room on their phone to add an app or like the migrant classrooms, the families don't have these type of smartphones. Um, that's okay. You could always um, do it on paper or do it on an iPad with the family, email it to them or the doctor and just delete it right off afterwards. So it's very versatile in the ways in which you can um, use it. Okay. So let's try to find two activities that we would recommend for Lucas. So if you go to the back arrow now, you're gonna see the hamburger. 
those three lines at the top left. So click on the hamburger and it's gonna bring you to sort of like the menu. And if you click tips and activities, it will give you all different tips and activities that are age appropriate. So this is really nice. So um, if you were say a home visitor and you're coming back once a week, you can say, why don't you work on these activities and I'll be back next week, right? So, um, and it's just, you don't have to think about activities. You can be like, oh, the CDC recommends you do these play activities. It's just nice parent engagement. All right, so now we're gonna do practice number two. This is our last baby. Um, so if you click on Lucas's name at the top, you can add another child. And this child is going to be Jordan. This is actually one of my students' babies. I'm always looking for pictures, um, especially because I'm white and most of my family is white. So I have very little diverse pictures to use. So if any of you ever want to email me pictures of your children, I will take them. Um, okay, anyway, sorry, squirrel, little side note there. Um, all right, so the date of birth of this child is July 3rd, 2021. Hit done. And this little girl is premature. So when it says, was your child premature, we're going to say yes. And this baby was five weeks premature. So if you click on that little premature screen, you have to scroll up till you hit five weeks. And then you're going to hit girl, scroll up a little bit and hit done. And this is really nice here because you're going to see it says Jordan is nine months old, but you're going to fill out the six month checklist because it corrected. So for those of you that aren't familiar with that, as a pediatric clinician, I always correct for children until they're two years of age, and we never correct after two. So if you're in a preschool classroom, it's never going to impact you anyways. We don't, we don't correct after age two. If you didn't know whether a child is born premature or not, it only benefits them to not put them in as premature, right? Because then they're going to be expected to do more skills. So it doesn't really matter if you're not sure, because when in doubt, we're referring, right? So don't worry if you don't know um, the child's past medical history. Okay, so that is how that works. But now I want to show you the ad appointment feature because I feel like this is one of the best features of the app. So if you scroll up where it says um, Jordan, at the very bottom, it says appointments. If you click add appointment, the families can actually, so this is a parent meeting I'm doing for another Head Start Center on May 3rd. You can enter in the a next appointment right into the app and they'll get a reminder, which is really nice. So for me as a feeding um, consultant in early intervention, I can put my next appointment, you know, they can put it right in there or they can pass me their phone and I can put it right in there. And I always ask them like, please have child hungry. <laughs> Please have the baby hungry. Um, but you could have the Zoom um, number in there, right? You could have any type of information that you wanted. So I'm going to type in um, parent meeting. The date is May 3rd. And the time is 2.30, which I thought that was a very bizarre time to have a parent meeting, but... Who knows? Um, and then you would fill in the rest, right? And so if you hit add appointment, um, when you go back to the main screen, you're going to see that it's nice and um, white at the bottom is the parent meeting. Okay, so just a nice feature there. One of the other um, features, if you go up to the hamburger in the top left corner, um, if someone says, you know, uh, my child um, isn't rolling and doesn't show affection and I'm not sure what to do, there's a couple things that you can do. Um, first, let's go ahead and look at the um, when to act early button. And it's just going to give you sort of a snapshot of things that you would want to act early if the child wasn't doing this. If you go back to the menu, you can also do the milestone overview button. And the milestone overview button is really nice for people like myself, uh, because if I only want to look at the motor skills, I can top like 
touch the movement yellow tab at the top and it's going to give me all the motor skills. I could do the blue language skills and it's going to give me all the language skills. So you can really, um, no one's expecting anyone to memorize when all of the milestones are, except for my students when they take their boards. Um, so this is like a nice cheat sheet of when um, certain kids of like when you were, would refer for when. So you can play around with the app a little bit and just know that um, it's pretty user friendly once you get going. Okay, um, moving forward here, I just wanted to let you know, um, I talked a little bit about how this has been this huge push to increase the amount of screening that's being done, right? You're screening on Head Start, pediatricians are screening, and really from 2002 to 2016, we did see this huge increase, right? From 23 to 63%, depending um, of where you live. And pediatricians can also bill for screening, right? So here's two very common screeners, the ages and stages, which is really popular in Massachusetts, as well as the SWIC. And what I hear parents saying is like, they don't know whether or not their child was screened while they were there, right? So um, they don't know, like they talk to the doctor and they may not know that the doctor was doing developmental monitoring or the doctor completed a de developmental screening. So what's supposed to happen is the doctor is supposed to talk about the results um, with the parents, but they may not understand that that was what was done. So it's really okay for the parents to ask, like, you know, was my child screened today? Or, you know, just kind of giving them that language. Um, I wanted to talk about the SWIC because if you are changing your screening tool or you have to re-up or it's being updated and you have to buy a new one, the SWIC is free. And not only is it free, but it comes in all of the languages that you see here on the right side. So I know for assessment tools, every you know eight to 10 years, they get updated and you have to buy all new ones and it's a huge amount of money. So just think about that for your assessment tools. If you need to um, update your screening tools, the SWIC is free. And it has the same ages as the American Academy of Pediatrics, right? It has the same forms as um, not only the Learn the Signs Act Early program, but also it matches the American Academy, Academy of Pediatrics well child visit schedule. And the ages and stages everybody loves because it has such great validity and reliability, right? The psychometric properties are really sound as well as the SWIC, right? So the SWIC also has really good validity and reliability. So it's a, you know, it's a good tool, which is really most important. Um, I also wanted to let you know that um, the Rita T is a level two ASD screener, autism spectrum um, disorder screener, and this is being used a lot in the Worcester area, but training is free for early intervention and early childhood providers, which you would be. So um, really just if you wanted to take a look at that training, here's the website and the email. I know um, you all are doing continuing ed and you have to choose what, what continuing ed you're going to do, um, but just to let you know that that is out there. Okay, so some takeaways from today. Um, $1 spent in preschool really saves $8 later in special education. So feel really good about what you're doing, right? Your preschool classrooms are saving tax dollar dollars, tax payer dollars, right? So all the work that you are doing on readiness skills, right? What does a kid need in kindergarten? Color cut, write their name. That's what they need. So all the work that you're doing in preschool is saving people money. So if anyone gives you a hard time, just remember that. Um, also, a doctor's referral is not required in Massachusetts to be evaluated for early intervention. And a doctor's a referral is never required for special education, regardless of your state. So we're really special here in Massachusetts as far as access. I can tell you the Hawaii ambassador was like, how did you, he's a pediatrician, how did you do this? I'm like, I don't know, it's before my time. Um, but we don't need a referral for early intervention. And again, big takeaway is that the earlier a child receives services, the less services they need, the better the child outcomes. So here is my email. Please email me if you have any questions and just know that you really do make a difference in the lives of these children. Um, here are some ways to um, stay in touch. So this year for the grant that I had through the CDC, I was able to pay for 50 professionals to go get their infant mental health endorsement. And I also had free continuing education. Um, so I, get, I had a webinar with free CEUs. 
And we also had um, an echo for continuing ed. And all of these opportunities are posted on the Mass Act Early Facebook page and um, are posted on the Mass Act Early website. So if you don't already follow us on Facebook, I'm not a big poster. Actually, I'm terrible. I was trying to do once a week and then I sort of gave up on that. Um, but I do, if we have training, I always post the trainings um, and it's always on the website. And the CDC also has a Facebook page and it's the Milestones Matter Facebook page, and they actually do a good job, unlike myself. Um, here's a list of all of the resources, so things that I might have talked about today. Here are all the links that you may want and the references. And this Zubler link right here is the new CDC article that has um, all of the updates, information for the checklist. Um, I'm going to um, take us off the recording and we can do questions. I just want to say thank you all so much for having me and listening to me. This is, this is really great.